What's up, Bitcoiners? Today's episode with shadowy supercoder Ben Kaufman is brought to you by Ledin.io, a better home for your Bitcoin. Ledin is a secure, simple, and easy-to-use platform for managing and growing your digital wealth with industry-best interest rates on savings. Or use your Bitcoin as collateral for loans. Ledin raises the bar for transparency in the industry with proof of reserves attestation. The interest rate for Bitcoin savings accounts is 6.1% APY for balances up to 2 BTC and 2.25% APY for any balance over 2 BTC. For USDC savings accounts, the interest rate is 9% APY on your full USDC balance. Listeners of this podcast, Get an exclusive offer of $50 free in USDC when you become a Ledin user and take out a Ledin loan using our link. Learn more, sign up, and get earning at start.ledn.io forward slash Bitcoin Matrix. And now, let's enter the Bitcoin Matrix with Ben Kaufman, where we dive into his work on the Spectre Project why he decided to leave Israel, what it's like to drop truth bombs all day, and his chances of getting deplatformed from Twitter. What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Ben Kaufman is a shadowy super coder unlicensed software engineer coding at Spectre Wallet. Ben is into coding and he also writes a lot about Austrian economics. His writing can be found at bencoffman.info. And in case you have trouble finding him, he can also be found at bencoffman.substack.com. Ben Kaufman, welcome to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, uh, I'm super excited to speak with you. To, to be honest, uh, not only did we meet at Bitcoin 2021 briefly, I really started keying in on your tweets since then. And I, I think they've been fire. Uh, I think you've just been dropping a lot of truth bombs. Uh, but before we get into all of that, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear about what you're doing over at Spectre Wallet. Well, I started working on Spectre Wallet around March 2020. Uh, pretty much just around um, COVID and everything started and all the all the mess up started. Um, I've been doing it for as an open source project for about a year and then started full time uh, a few months ago. Um, so it just started as me finding the project and just starting using it myself. So I really liked it. I thought it's a great product. Um, but they saw that there are a lot of features that I want missing. There are a lot of bugs and stuff. So I just started fixing it up myself. I started contributing myself and doing what uh, like features that I wanted to have there for myself. Uh, and from that, it kind of uh, escalated into full-time work, basically. Oh, wow. So it, Spectre, while it, it's an open source project, how, how do they have funding or how do they kind of create sustainability for, for the project? So right now we are mostly uh, donation funded. Um, there is some funding from uh, from one of the co-founders also, and we are looking now at um, at ways to to make it more sustainable. So we're looking into maybe some service integrations or stuff like that. Uh, but we're still looking into how to make it more sustainable. Awesome. And it seems like you joined the team through your own proof of work. Uh, you know, looking to add features and, and things that you wanted to uh, get out of the the product. And, and so kind of wondering there, you know, what what can you tell us more about what Spectre was providing for you before you you joined the team? And, and then a little bit about what you've added since then and, and where it's going. Sorry, can you repeat the last sentence, please? And, and then where, you know, maybe where it's going. I know you guys just rolled out Spectre uh, version 1.6 which had some new highlights around Taproot and foundation mm -hmm. uh, passport support. But I, I'd love to get into, you know, exactly what it was when you found it and, and where it's kind of gone since then. Yeah, when I started working on it, it was, uh, I would say, quite basic. It was very early. 
I think I was probably one of the first users um, that started using it. Um, it was still more of an, a very better experimental project, I would say. Uh, and it was like that for a few months, even after I started contributing. But yeah, it was just, it was in the very beginning, there were a lot of features that were still missing, uh, quite a few bugs, and it was still uh, quite hard to to install and to set up, I'd say, uh, for non-technical users at least. Sure, just um, what are some of the basic features of Spectre Wallet? You know, whether it's being, you know, using the watch wallet yeah. or what things you can create uh, in terms of your own hardware wallet or, uh, you know, DIY style or uh, just sort of integrating with multi-sig. Yeah, so Spectre is basically an alternative interface for Bitcoin Core. So you have the Bitcoin Core node, uh, that you, you're running, or now you can even do it from within Spectre. But all Spectre does is connecting to that node and pro providing an alternative interface to use it compared to the Bitcoin Core default uh, GUI. So the Bitcoin Core GUI is uh, very basic, I would say. Um, it doesn't have stuff that uh, now in Spectre, it's a lot easier to add, like um, hardware wallet integration, uh, like music support um, and stuff like that. So basically Spectre is just a way to use your own node with uh, hardware wallets, with multi-sig, um, et cetera. Yeah, so to kind of frame that up, maybe you're, someone's using Casa or Unchained and maybe this is a way to uh, just not use those services but and get mm -hmm. everything you could with multi-sig and build it off from your for yourself mm -hmm. DIY. Yeah, that's that's more or less a DIY, yeah. A DIY yeah. multi-sig. And and could you get, you know, mm -hmm. kind of go over some of the the benefits of of kind of interacting with core directly and and using multi-sig and taproot and and what and mm -hmm. and and being air gapped? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So the main benefit of using your own personal node versus like for example with Electrum using random nodes is that you don't have to trust others and you don't have to leak any of your private information. So with um, with services that you use, like uh, even just Trezor or Ledger, like normal website, you're leaking your privacy to them because you're asking them for how much you have on your addresses. So you're giving them basically your addresses and then they can um, know stuff about you. It leaks privacy and you have to trust them that they are not lying to you. Uh, that this is like a real transaction, that this is uh, not, you know, not a fake Bitcoin. Um, so this is like the main, um, the main benefits of using your own node. And to do this, like as a DIY, it just adds to sovereignty. It's, I would say it's a, it's a trade-off because with other services, with Casa or Unchained, they have one key. And then on the one hand, they have one key, but on the other hand, you don't uh, risk, um, like if you fuck up a lot yourself, you still have uh, some help, basically. So there is some trade-off here, but it gives, it leans more to the DIY and sovereign way to do it. No, and about AirGap, it's um, basically Spectre supports AirGap devices. And also there is the Spectre DIY project, which is an AirGap, uh, well, optionally AirGap, um, device that you can build yourself, like a DIY, so you can build it from off-the-shelf components, um, and that's a, a fully functional hardware wallet. How hard is it to, you know, what kind of uh, abilities does one have to have to build their own hardware wallet that's air-gapped? You basically need to know how to use mask and tape. That's how easy it is. Right, um, right. There is uh, there is no soldering or anything like that necessary. Uh, I know I do not know how to soldier, and I'm terrible with stuff like dates. And even I was able to build it in a few minutes. Um, it's really it's super simple. You just connect uh, the the camera to the board, um, and you're more or less done. Uh, and you can buy you buy yourself some uh, casing or even print it. Uh, 3D print it yourself if you have a 3D printer, and that's it. Yeah. And how does one use Spectre Wallet as like a watch wallet? And what are some of the mm -hmm. useful benefits of yeah. that? Yeah. So Spectre does support uh, like a hot wallet functionality. 
So it can be a hot wallet, but it, when it's not like a, a hot wallet, it's by the, it's when you use it com with, for example, a hardware wallet. Technically, it's a watch only because the keys are not on the are not on the device are not on the uh, computer. The inspector doesn't have any access to the keys at any time. They are only on the hardware wallet. Um, so Spectre is technically mostly used as a watch-only wallet to watch funds that are on hardware wallet or on a multi-sig with hardware wallets. Um, not really for like, um, not that much that I know of for a hot wallet. Yeah. And how does one think about using a watch wallet? Is that just to check your balance and make sure it's still there? Uh, even though, you know, yeah, you're it's... multi-sig, you know, maybe geographically dispersed and, and you don't want to actually mm -hmm. access those keys. Yeah, yeah, it's basically it's for just checking the balance, generating addresses, and creating an unsigned uh, transaction. So the what is called PSBT, partially signed Bitcoin transaction. So you uh, can generate it from from Spectre, and then you give it to the hardware wallet. You can do it all via the Spectre interface. Um, you just give it to the hardware wallet, and then the hardware wallet gives you gives it back to you signed. Right. And I'm kind of curious, what what about this project uh, kind of drew you in both as a user and, and now as as a coder? And, you know, what, why, you know, you could put your efforts maybe anywhere in this space or other spaces. What what was it about this particular project that you, you wanted to work on this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think using your own node is just very much, very important. And I think until Spectre was, uh, until Spectre arrived, it was very hard to, to do, especially multi-sig with your own node or using hardware wallets with your own node. Um, it was mm. just, you could do it with Electrum personal server, but that was even for me that as a tech, very technical user, it was still very much annoying and uh, complicated to set up the, the Electrum server. Um, so I think in this sense, Spectre is very much important to, to make sure that people can run their own nodes um, even now, Spectre has the option to, um, if you don't have a node yet, to set a node for you. So everything can be set up with one click from Spectre itself. So I think it's very important for people to use their own nodes. And I think Spectre is a great tool for that. That's why I want to focus on it. I want to focus on making sure that people can use their own node and be self-sovereign like that. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm kind of curious. Why, why the name Spectre? Yeah, so it came. This was no. This was uh, like chosen before I came, but it came. In, it comes from uh, the crypto anarchy manifesto. Um, it's like a specter is haunting the the world. Uh, the specter of crypto anarchy. Right. So which, this is where the the name comes from. Yeah, I think which explains sort of uh, some of the artwork around the ghosts and. and... <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, when I was downloading the software, I was a little like, huh, I don't know. Uh, maybe that, that's scary for a reason. But no, and then I, I read up about why the name Spectre. And uh, what, what's the mm -hmm. community like around, around the project? I think there's quite a big community. Uh, I mean, in the Telegram channel, we have, um, I think, 1,500 users um, in our Telegram group. Um, we don't have any idea really about how many users we have. We can like estimate, but it's we don't really track anything ourselves. So it's very hard to know. Uh, Spectre has no analytics in it or anything like that. Sure. Uh, but it seems, I, I think there's quite a big community, especially from when I go to conferences, stuff like that. People seem very excited. And yeah. I'm really happy that that this tool is used so much and people are using their own nodes. I think it's really important for Bitcoin uh, to be resilient. Yeah. Could you maybe elaborate on how everyone or not everyone, but people running their own nodes uh, makes the network more resilient? Yeah. So if you don't run your own node, you're basically trusting a service provider to tell you your balance, to tell you your to tell you how much Bitcoin you have and if the transaction that you received is valid or not. Um, now, besides the privacy aspect, which of course for privacy, I think it's very clear why it's uh, bad. You have to leak your, your address and tell a service provider, hey, this is my address. Uh, and then you can tell if, if you're KYC, it's the worst. But even if you're not, you can tell from your IP address or stuff like that. Uh, so from the privacy aspect, I think it should be clear why it's bad. 
But then also the, the more important point in my opinion is that on a on a large scale, if a lot of people are not using their own node, basically, uh, if a lot of people trust some sort of service provider, then those centralized broke up for a bit. Hey, do you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. I don't know what's what's wrong with the internet here. So where where should I continue from? The question was kind of uh, what what is how running on your own node makes the network more resilient. And we were talking, I think mm -hmm. at that point, I think you, you, you're talking about centralization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, besides the privacy issues, once uh, you basically uh, people start not to use their own node and start trusting centralized service providers to tell them uh, what is true and what is false, what is a valid Bitcoin transaction and what is not, it creates centralization. So these uh, these nodes that are telling a lot of people how how much Bitcoin they have or what is a valid transaction now can can basically decide on the rules of the network. So for example, if ninety percent uh, of the users um, trust, let's say five big companies that uh, run them, those five companies have a huge power. They can basically fork up the rules. And then the minority, the 10% minority that runs their own nodes will basically be cut off of the 90% that are not that are not running the nodes that are trusting the, the centralized entities. Um, and then basically the even though it doesn't they it doesn't technically affect the, the minority that runs their own nodes, it cannot uh, they now they are in a situation when they have to accept the two rules of the larger um, centralized services or face the the, uh, uh, the inability to transact with 90% of the network. Uh, so economically, it, it, it creates bad incentives. Uh, it, it creates centralization. It creates um, basically a way for the large entities to force users uh, to force uh, the, the minority that runs their own node to accept the, the change of the rules. Um, so this is uh, this basically this is a, a centralization risk and why people should run their own and not trust to verify. Sure. When you think about sort of a, a newbie who's getting into into Bitcoin and maybe they're buying ten dollars a day on Cash App or whatever it may be, and you're thinking through like how almost backwards from maybe your own experience or what the generalization of everyone's experience is, but like. Where do you see that person progressing from, you know, storing their sats on on Cash App to getting maybe a Trezor to then getting a, a cold card to multi-sig with maybe on-chain or Casa or and then graduating to Spectre? And, and maybe not for everyone goes through that 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 exact path, but you know, wh where do you kind of see on the spectrum of, because I almost see that there's, there's a, the individual's journey onto decentralization. So Bitcoin's already there, but the individual kind of learns about decentralization and goes through the own progress of getting less centralized through, you know, in, in their involvement with the Bitcoin network and, and their interaction with certain services and, and vendors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think for, for a newbie that starts, um, if it's a small amount still, uh, or if they are not very technical, uh, like, you know, like my grandmother or something, uh, I think using some centralized service and exchanges is, is better than not having any Bitcoin at all. Uh, but it's, it's not good to, to, to leave it there. I'd say once you, you start, um, you should try to learn more to try to, uh, to start maybe with with a, like a mobile software wallet like a blue wallet or green wallet or something like that um, just to you know just to get familiar with how Bitcoin works and basic uh, like the very basics uh, after you understand that after you understand how to use it maybe get a hardware wallet if, if it's a larger amount of, of Bitcoin that you're securing um and once once you understand that you can try more in, and go more into the rabbit hole of running your own node etc uh so you don't have to, to start all at once and you shouldn't do something you're not comfortable with uh don't like risk your your bitcoin by doing stuff you do not understand 
but it's very i think it's very important to at least try to learn it slowly and and uh improve your setup slowly what what was your journey like did you grok a lot of this really quickly uh no I, not at all yeah and <laughs> not think, at all right so what kind of uh was it the economics the austrian economics and the hard money that 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 piqued your interest at first was the, the technology was it hard for you not to get fall down sort of the the shit coin, uh, you know, newest and latest iteration uh, kind of bullshit around blockchain? Mm-hmm. Uh, when did privacy and sort of nonsense, uh, uncensorability and, or censorable money become so important to you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I started um, more from the technical side. And only learned the economics uh, quite a bit after, probably a year or so after I got into the more economic side and started reading, uh, like taking uh, safety classes and uh, reading human action, reading, uh, you know, basically Menger, all the Austrian economics um, and understanding that part. But before it was only from the more technical side, I'd say I did, um, I did, do shit coins for for a bit. Um, I was yeah. I think if I knew the, the economic side better, and that's what what helped me get out of shit coins, uh, learning about the economic side. Um, but before that, I was yeah, I was into shit coins, and as like as probably most of the people uh, did, and I regret it as most of the bitcoiners do. Um, so yeah. Um, that's that was like my my journey. It, it's it doesn't start very easy. I uh, don't understand most of the stuff at first, um, but then slowly I, I learned all of everything basically. Yeah, I mean that's a lot. Still a lot of information. It's kind of a mountain to climb. What what do you think you would have been doing with your time if it wasn't for that that sort of path and learning about Bitcoin and economics and and, and sort of the, these things. I would have probably continued. I was a freelancer before that, like doing uh, mo- mostly mobile development, but generally a lot of stuff, uh, but mostly focusing on mobile. I think I could have probably continued to do that and uh, just um, just do that if if not for Bitcoin. Right. And do, would you, I mean, it seems like in Bitcoin years could be like four years. Do you, do you kind of remember what maybe your ambitions were or where you were trying to take that career path? Mm, not really, not something specific. It was quite, I was quite beginning uh, back then. Uh, so it was, uh, I was, I'm quite young. So I, it wasn't quite begin, uh, the beginning for me. Uh, I was doing been freelancing for maybe uh, two years before that, I think. Um, so not a lot, but uh, I'm not sure where, where would have I been if not for Bitcoin right now. I really don't know. Has Bitcoin changed you? Or you know? Yeah, that, for yeah. sure, a lot. Uh, I mean, in, um, yeah, I think so, a lot. In in, in what kind of ways? Uh, you know, maybe in terms of just in terms of maybe how you think about the future and and managing, mm-hmm. you know, finances and economics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I don't think it changed me much. Just it uh, shaped my my understanding of it and shaped my my view. Um, so I think it's mostly uh, that it helped me shape my views on on the subject. I didn't have strong strong opinions about it. I guess I was just quite young then, uh, but it definitely helped me shape my my understanding of uh, of politics, my understanding of um, of money, of finance, of economics. Um, so yeah, it was probably the most influential part on my on my. Um, on my understanding of politics, on my understanding of uh, economics, um, etc. Uh, has it impacted maybe how you frame up what's going on with you know everything with COVID and the pandemic? Mm-hmm. Um, I think so. To be honest, I think it, it helped me um, see more like to the side of of, uh, of freedom and uh, basically government overreach. 
And then when you see government over, overreach through history, um, both economically and otherwise, uh, you can easily see that what's happening now is just uh, a government abusing its power. Uh, it's very clear and very simple. Right. And, and kind of speaking to that, like what, what's, uh, I'm assuming you're not in Israel now. And, and mm-hmm. no, I'm not. So what was it like in Israel before you left? Uh, maybe some of the reasons you, you chose to leave. Mm-hmm. The main reason, to be honest, was the, the 24-7 propaganda of uh, stay home, get vaccinated, listen to the government, do this, don't do that. Um, wear, wear a mask everywhere. Um, it was, uh, you know, it was the lockdowns that were constant. Uh, there was um, always uh, where there was for a long time a uh, requirement to wear a mask even outside just in the street. There was a lot of stuff that just was was crazy. There was even lockdown where you couldn't fly out or fly into Israel. So Israel was the only country where citizens were not allowed to get inside the country. If you were a citizen and you were, you there was like a period, I don't remember how long, uh, that you couldn't like enter Israel basically, even though you have the passport and everything. So as far as I know, Israel is the only one that did that. And it's it's quite insane to be honest. How how could you stay in a country where you you cannot have any guarantee that you can get out or get in? Um, I just uh, I, that's uh, one of the things that were the most uh, like that I couldn't stand really. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Logically, was it still a hard decision to leave? And, and what are the ramifications of that? Do you know when and if you'll go back? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure yet. I might go back uh, to... I don't think I'll go back to live there um, ever again. Visits, maybe, but um, probably not very long visits. Oh, were you born in Israel? Yeah, yeah. I was born in Israel, yes. And, and how do you like, think about what Israel is doing now and, you know, Israel's history of being born out of, you know, World War II and, and the Holocaust and almost, you know, wh- where it is now and, and where it's going. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's insane. It's extremely responsible. It's extremely dangerous. Um, the, now they're trying to push on everybody to take a third vaccine even though there were no tests for, for doing that. There was no, uh, the only thing, basis for that was a gut feeling of an expert committee that is uh, getting f- funding from Pfizer for the researchers. So obviously they, can, they are biased. And obviously you cannot really trust just, you know, uh, just uh, the gut feeling of, of such a committee. You have to start by, by you know, having clinical trials, having some data, some something. So this this one was extremely um, it was just crazy in in my view, but besides there is a nonstop propaganda really for for everything. There is a vaccine passport system now that you cannot do a lot of stuff unless you take the vaccine or you get tested at your own expense every day or something like you know not not something very doable. So I I. I cannot understand how people just accept it. Um, I think it's just uh, a very slow uh, process of uh, stacking more and more restrictions and more and more infringements on people's rights. Uh, I don't think it would have worked if from day one they would say, okay, now we have like a, like a vaccine passport system or whatever like this. Uh, I don't think it would have worked, but once they do it slowly, 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 I think that's that's what made it work. We've added a second sponsor here on the Bitcoin Matrix podcast, and I could not be more excited about this partnership. Over the next several months, I'll be sharing with you all sorts of information about the Bitcoin 2022 conference, which celebrates Bitcoin over four days, April 6th through 9th, with four different passes. The four days include Industry Day, two days of main events and speakers, and lastly, a Festival Day, which is a day of music and networking. Prices will continue to rise over the next few months, 
So get in early and use my affiliate code for 10% off your tickets. I can't tell you how much fun I had at last year's conference. This year, they're adding a fourth day for the Sound Money Music Festival. I'm sure it's going to be off the hook. I'll be there, meet me there, and let's grab that beer or just shoot the shit about Bitcoin. So go to TIXR.com forward slash PR forward slash Cedric 2022 forward slash 26217. And remember to use the code Cedric 2022 and get 10% off your tickets to Bitcoin 2022. You're not going to want to miss this incredible event. And now let's re-enter the Bitcoin matrix with the young shadowy super coder Ben Kaufman. Yeah, I mean, it's absurd to me, like insane that you would tie civil liberties to uh, medical records. Uh, I, I really uh, kind of makes me angry. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, on one hand, though, you know, I, I, I really understand, you know, if you, if you can't enter or leave a country, you know, no matter what rights you think you have, you really have permissions and you're not free. And, and I would leave. Uh, on the other hand, though, I think if, you know, this is happening in Israel, you know, where is it not going to happen? And, and you know, at what point do people stay and fight? Uh, and I'm not putting that on you, but it's just sort of, do you mm-hmm. think, and I'm getting more at the macro here and on the larger scale, like, where do you think, you know, are you just going to be on the run uh, and going from jurisdiction to jurisdiction? Do you think things are going to blow over in, in a few years and, you, and, and you'll be able to find a place to be? And I'm, you in the general sense, not, not Ben, but how do you think things are going and, and, and what kind of trajectory or arc do you see? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think in the next few years, they will, most of the world will get worse, uh, but some parts will get better probably. I think Central and um, uh, South America have, have quite some potential uh, and obviously some parts of the United States like Texas. And Florida, um, I think they have a lot of potential. And um, I think in the in the long run, it will just get worse in in some places, but others will just get better. So I will be going for for those places. Sure. And what about in terms of cyberspace? I mean, you've started the subset stack. You're you're getting ready to be on person and de platformed in some ways, maybe from Twitter. Uh, your tweets have just been pure truth bombs. You know, just things like good morning, everyone, except people who want to force decisions on other people's bodies. Um, it's not unvaccinated. It's not vaccinated mm-hmm. versus unvaccinated. It's the government versus the people. Good morning, everyone, except central bankers. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? Do you think you're going to get deplatformed? What do you think the ramifications are of that? Uh, do we just get more? Are we? Does that lead to us not being able to communicate across certain in certain ways? So maybe you have physical freedom wherever you end up, if, but you're not online or you're not on you know the platforms that can find you. I can't hear your ideas mm-hmm. and things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think they will try to censor like I'm. Um, think I'm already shadow banned on Twitter uh, from what I remember. Mm. And yeah, I think they will just try to censor uh, people that, that talk about it more, more aggressively. Um, this will probably push us towards uh, other, other medias uh, that are, you know, more um, less censoring or even like self sovereign, uh, like using Mastodon, for example, or using whatever, um, whatever other solution that will come up. Um, but I do think this will, uh, this will just push, uh, push people towards the more decentralized uh, networks rather than the centralized services that are censoring so heavily. Right. Another tweet. Uh, have we tried to just ban COVID? Uh, the government cannot control the climate, no matter how much taxes you'll pay them. Uh, you know, you speak, you seem to speak with a lot of uh, clarity. You're great at shit posting. Uh, but I, I think what you're doing by by leaving your homeland and and seeking freedom is very courageous. What what do you make of the people who chose not to leave? Um, the people your age who uh, are on lockdown, and you know what do you, what do you kind of uh, make of the situation? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I think some people, yeah, it's it's uh, very difficult to live sometimes. So I understand it's not in all situations that you can uh, just live. For me, it's probably easier because I'm younger. Uh, it's not so easy, but it's still easier than uh, people with families and stuff like that, I guess. Uh, but I think it's it's still very important to try at least to live, or if you don't live, to still try to to have some resistance to to the to all the madness. Um, I think even it doesn't matter if you want to get vaccinated or not. Uh, in my opinion, even if you take the vaccine, if you're not taking the vaccine, what's important is that you're not being part of the vaccine passport system, that even if you're vaccinated, you should refuse being part of it. You should refuse uh, the, the using this this so-called privilege. This should not be part of, uh, you should not support it basically. Um, so this this is what, what I think people should do. I think people should just reject all this, all this nonsense. Yeah, I agree. What I think is remarkable though, is just how much clarity you have uh, at your age in terms of conviction. Uh, and I think age is nothing but a number, but you know, I had a lot of conviction uh, or strongly held opinions uh, when I was younger. Uh, not all of those uh, I was right on, uh, or I was wrong on a lot of them. You know, it, it does take courage to buck the system and go against the grain and, and you know, go left when everyone's going right. Uh, and I'm kind of curious what, your experience has been like now on, you know, like going to Bitcoin 2021 and meeting Bitcoiners in, in meat space. Has it been like something like an, uh, an underground railroad system where you, you can meet friendly people in distant places and 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 kind of help get things done to just having a network? Uh, I think you could describe it this way. Yeah, I think Bitcoiners is our great worldwide network. Um, that you can always find somebody at some place to, to hang out with and chat and just meet and have like normal normal conversation with. Sorry, hello? Yeah, hi. Uh, you were saying you could have normal <laughs> conversations with. And... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, just to have normal conversation with. So I think Bitcoiners are a great network. Um, I think there's, yeah, all the meetups, everything. Uh, it's so amazing to uh, to be with with everybody and just you know just feel normal again. Yeah. Can uh, has there been anything else in terms of uh, like what what was your experience like at Bitcoin twenty twenty one? Yeah, Bitcoin twenty twenty one was was great. People were uh, finally uh, like acting normally. Uh, there was very little of of all the all the nonsense that's going on. People were acting like finally we do we're acting normal um and it went completely fine i mean uh that that was a completely like there was a great event so you just meet all those uh like-minded people it's it's very encouraging i think yeah uh i i was there uh, i i really enjoyed it immensely i just got back from bitbox boom um and and those were the two events that i've i've been at and uh, it was just incredible to be around people that were happy and optimistic and, and celebrating life and, and just, and doing things that, you know, I think are you know, trying to make the world a better place, but um, I'm kind of curious, like where, where are things for you now? Is it just, you, you're moving a lot. Are you uh, settling down in a new place and, and starting like to kind of grow roots in somewhere new? And uh, I'm not trying to dox you on that front, but just. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Did you? Uh, um... I, I lost you in the last sentence, I think. OK, yeah. So, yeah, just, you know, how much I, I don't know if you're moving around to kind of not go home or, or you're kind of finding a new mm -hmm. spot to be. And if you are moving around, like how much are you impacted, uh, you know, by what's going on and, you know, do you have to take tests, you know, wherever you're going or wherever you, you leave from and, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm mostly traveling and moving around right now. Uh, some places require tests, some places don't. I like a lot more to go to a place that doesn't require it, uh, but sometimes for a conference or something, they have to. But yeah, I've been mostly going around and trying to find like the best place to to be. 
Right. And is it mostly um, with other Bitcoiners via conferences or other hotspots? Or are you sometimes just getting off the beaten path by yourself and and kind of experiencing uh, the world without Bitcoiners around you in Meetspace? Uh, I'd say mostly with Bitcoiners, sometimes alone, but mostly with Bitcoiners. I mean, there's a lot and uh, a lot that are in the same situation that trying to find a new place to be at. Right. So it's truly like an underground railroad and mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and everyone's pulling each other forward. Um, ha has there been any, uh, you know, tips or, you know, or kind of wisdom that you've learned along the way for maybe people that are, you know, kind of embarking on the same situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, South Cent and Central America are currently the, the freest places uh, that you can find. Um, so I think these are the places that still have the chance, like Europe is, uh, is quite dead and uh, the U S I mean, there is, if you can get in, uh, you need usually a visa, but if you can get in, then, uh, there are Texas and there is uh, Florida and a few other States. Uh, so it's not too bad as well as an option, but I would say central and South America are the, the places to be. And in what ways are they more free? Is it, uh, you know, less mass mandates and uh, mm -hmm. less sort of, uh, is it is on the media less? Uh, is it talked about less or, or in other ways? Yeah, less, less infringement, uh, less uh, lockdowns, less uh, curfews, less uh, testing requirements, no vaccine passports um etc so all all of that basically it it feels mostly normal uh in a lot of places it feels like stuff or is is normal again um mm -hmm. there are some masks everywhere but uh they like people uh, at least where i am right now people don't bother you about it uh, i'm kind of curious anecdotally has and this is bitcoiners or not but have you run into maybe expats from anywhere uh, that are more like, like families, young families uh, who are doing the same thing that you're doing, just they happen to be with families and kids. Mm, not really. Maybe a, a few, but really not many. It's mostly uh, single people right now or couples, but families with kids is way, way less. Right. What do you, what do you think is the most important initiatives in Bitcoin? And initiatives might not be the right word because there's no company, no CEO or whatever, but like, you know, is, is it what's going on at Lightning? Is it the rollout of Taproot, it, you know, and, and what's and multi-sig? Is, is it something else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard for me to say, like, one thing that is the, the most important or the most exciting. Like, I really think that Lightning is very cool and making great progress. Um, I think Taproot is will be really great to have already now. And I'm looking forward for support for it in hardware wallets and stuff like that. Um, and also like the utilization of its uh, features of more complex uh, scripts and that kind of stuff. Um, in terms of new soft forks, I don't know what will come. Maybe uh, maybe um, any prev out, uh, maybe something else. Uh, but again, there is just a lot of stuff, a lot of new developments and it's, it's all really cool. I, I don't have anything specific that is the most exciting to be honest hmm. what about in terms of uh not you know economics or just a cultural awareness uh what do you make of the the el salvador going legal in a few days here and, and in terms of mm -hmm. bitcoin being used as legal legal tender and I'm, I'm really actually curious what do you think of sort of government you know rolled out uh wallets and and sort of the potential for a KYC uh, surveillance system through chain analysis and, and any maybe the maybe the negative effects or externalities that we're not seeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not too up to date with the information on El Salvador, so maybe I'm wrong about some stuff. So I think in general, it's pretty cool that a country decided to adopt Bitcoin as its uh, legal tender. Um, I think it's it's way better than than having the the USD or whatever like shitcoin they have they want to have there. Um, I think Bitcoin is is the best choice as a legal tender. 
Um, so I think this is a pretty exciting development. Uh, about the government wallet, I don't like it so much, to be honest, that, that there is the, the wallet of the government. And I don't know about the KYC, if they have KYC requirements there or not. Uh, but if they do, I think it's pretty bad. And even if they don't, um, I find it hard to trust a government wallet. Uh, so maybe it's it's fine for like people with that need a solution for small amounts or something. But for a large at large scale or in the future, I think it's not uh, it's not the way to go. And, and do you sort of have a take on hyper Bitcoinization or uh, sort of hyper Bitcoinization's impact on? on states and nation states and, and central banks? I'm not sure yet. So it's really hard to, to, to say right now. Uh, I think it will eventually, you know, uh, beat out central banks. I think people will slowly migrate to Bitcoin and make central banks obsolete. But I have no idea how long it will take or how bad will uh, the state basically fight back against Bitcoin and try to stop it when it gets bigger. Uh, right now, I think we're still as as much as we. Uh, I think so. Once once Bitcoin gets bigger, maybe there will be more resistance from governments, and then we we have to see how it will go, how it will play out. But in the long run, I think it it could replace central banks, and I think it will replace central banks banks and uh, government currencies, and especially prevent uh, their emergence of CBDCs. Mm. If you could kind of rank, like, how would you describe your level of freedom or sovereignty right now in the world? In the world? Like, yeah, if you general? could say, like, yeah, with your ability to move around, uh, how much do you, do you think you have complete sovereignty and freedom? Or is it still uh, a struggle against the state as an individual? Are you, how much? Think, yeah, I think for me, it's not too bad, especially compared to others. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that could have been a lot better. And especially now with, with the COVID situation, uh, all countries have their new restrictions and nonsense. But for me personally, I think it's it's not really so bad. Uh, but for a lot of people, I think it's, it, it's quite, it's getting really, really bad right now. Right. Would you get, would you have like words of, advice for you know zoomers or or younger people to, you know like what to make of the situation and and what kind of what advice would you give to people i'd i'd tell people to first of all stop stop complying with with their nonsense reject the the lockdowns reject their their mandates and their uh, vaccine passports and all this this nonsense all this political nonsense uh, this is just not about health, it's about control. And you, you have to, first of all, just completely reject it. Uh, I'd say another thing is to, to know your rights. So a lot of times people think that they mm. cannot uh, travel or they have to do this or have to do that because they heard it on the TV. But in it's the law says something very different and it gives you a lot more freedom than, than you know. So be aware of that. Um, or if you can, even better, just just live, just live to somewhere that is uh, that will give you better life, that will not be as oppressive. Um, I'd say that's that's the best thing, and try to start joining communities, uh, either local or even in online communities. Just try to do that. Try to find communities and other like-minded people that will help you in the way. Yeah. Do you, do you think you always were someone who kind of questioned authority and pushed back and things have gotten worse um, or do you think you can or, or is this kind of a, a, an awakening now and things are just really bad and you didn't know anything before, like didn't look at it before? Yeah, I think I always kind of questioned authority, but not like that, not to that extent. So it's it's definitely pushing me more and more into uh um, into the radical side, let's call it that way. Right. And, and do you think, do you think things are way worse than they were before, or maybe we're just more in tune with some things, or we don't agree with some things, or 
you know, in what sense? Sorry, in, you know, is this? It, do you kind of subscribe to whether this is like a fourth turning, and and we're going through some sort of really big uh, dynamic change, and things are getting a lot worse, or is this kind of just maybe just uh, impacting us in ways that we don't like, and it's not that it, it, in terms of uh, humanity and, and the long term time scales is. Mm-hmm. Do you, do, do you think things are getting a lot worse and, and are they getting worse quicker or is this really just another drop in the bucket? No, I definitely think things are getting worse and accelerating and I think there is quite some change uh, in the world going on right now. I think there is definitely some some sort of shift that, that is going on. Uh, I don't think this is just uh, a small hiccup that will get us back to normal. I don't think we're getting to normal back again. Um, so yeah, I think things are just getting worse here. Do you think like if, if the world woke up and was, uh, ready for Bitcoin, do you think Bitcoin is ready for the whole world to be onboarded? Whether, and in terms of whether, uh, that meant like a lot of people would get on board through KYC exchanges, and maybe that's not a good thing. Um, how much of us is Bitcoin a solution right now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think for the entire world, I definitely don't think so. I mean, a lot of the world is not connected yet to the internet even or don't have uh, a cell phone for everything. All of that is improving a lot. And Bitcoin itself is, is uh, needs to figure like scalability solutions. Even with Lightning, I don't think we can scale for the entire world. We will need uh, also uh, either side chains or stuff like that. So stuff that is even more centralized because it's it it's eight eight billion people or something like that is just impossible to have everybody's UTXOs like that. It would be insane if we have that tomorrow. Um so I think there's still a long way to make Bitcoin ready for the entire world. Uh but I think we're we're making very good progress. Right. Uh, I'm gonna read a few more of your your tweets. Vaccine passports are racist. The hatred towards the unvaccinated is based on unscientific witch hunting, an urge to control others, and a complete ignorance of politics. Okay, this is just a thought, but wouldn't it actually be most profitable for pharmaceutical companies to produce ineffective vaccines so that people need to get them repeatedly and they make more money? The limitations on unvaccinated are punishments for disobedience to the government. They have nothing to do with health. People who compare the severity of COVID to the Black Death are idiots. Good morning, everyone, except the Australian government and their collaborators. Um, like I said, I mean, I, I think it's gutsy. And I, I think that I, mean, I think it's gutsy because you're speaking truth to power. And I think it's it's really interesting what you're going through now with possibly the threat of of being deplatformed and canceled on Twitter. Uh, I don't know if you have any final thoughts on that. Uh, we've really covered everything I set out to cover. I definitely want to leave you with, you know, is there anything that you want to cover or final thoughts? But uh, I'm kind of curious about, you know, yeah, again, just if you get deplatformed from Twitter, like, you mm-hmm. know. It, mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't have any like specific final final thoughts here. If I get a platform from Twitter, I'll probably try to respond. But I'm also starting this Substack. Maybe I will start a Telegram channel. I'm I'm still figuring this out, like uh, backup plans. But um, I think it's it's quite likely that at some point, at least, I will be I will be banned. I mean, others were banned for much less than than what I'm saying. I think so. Yeah, I think right now I'll just I'll try to to figure out like backup solutions and ways to reach out to people. Yeah, that's crazy. Let let everyone know now where they could find you, uh, including you know Substack. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so on uh, either my email, my personal website, uh, benkaufman.info, um, my Substack. Right now, benkaufman.substack.com. Um, my Twitter, my Telegram. I'm available in quite a few, quite a few ways. Uh, so if if anyone needs or wants to reach out, um, usually uh, it's it shouldn't be very hard. Yeah, man, definitely. Uh, I'm kind of 
Uh, I would be so bummed if you were canceled from Twitter. And I think <laughs> things would be just feel a little bit more real. Uh, uh, you know, just because uh, I've seen other people get, you know, knocked off of Twitter, but it's been a little bit more for pure shit posting. And I've seen some mm-hmm. of the bigger accounts, you know, uh, specifically, you know, Alex Barrison, who you, you sort of wrote your first Substack entry about and, and his situation. And I clicked on the link there. And I think that's just a crazy story. And and even Francis uh, Puglio has been, you know, retweeting. I think it was the the one of the main viral tweets that got him kicked off. And <laughs> it's just really scary how 1984 and Animal Farm and, you know, Fahrenheit 451 is it, it kind of it's getting out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. So uh, I, I wish you all the luck in your travels. And I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on the show. Um, this has been so dope. I really appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, ma'am. Ben Kaufman, the young shadowy super coder on leaving Israel, building Spectre, and dropping truth bombs on Twitter. This episode was brought to you by Ledin, Bitcoin Magazine, and the Bitcoin 2022 Conference. Ledin.io is a secure, simple, and easy to use platform for managing and growing your digital wealth. If you want to see what it's all about and get $50 free in USDC when you take out your first lead in loan, head over to start.ledin.io forward slash Bitcoin Matrix. Last year, around 13,000 Bitcoiners came to celebrate Bitcoin at Bitcoin 2021 in Miami. They are expecting 35,000 people this year for Bitcoin 2022. It's going to be off the hook, and I can't wait to see you there and grab that beer. For 10% off your tickets, use my code CEDRIC2022 and check the show notes for the link and more details. And thank you for listening. If you dig the chats, please make sure to subscribe, rate, review, and share with your friends and family. That's the best way to support the show and make sure you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes. So many fresh and dope guests are already lined up for the fall that you won't want to miss, like Sebastian Bunny, Matt Hill, and VJ Boyapati. Stack sats and stay laser focused. This is Cedric. Peace.